In the span of less than 50 years, a couple of generations, we have made great strides in our understanding of our relationship to the earth. Children today have a very deep concern about the future of our planet and the use of our collective natural resources. Our very survival will be determined by the ability of people at the community level to continue to maintain a strong, sustainable bond with their land. An ecosystem is a community. The idea of community and ecosystem really had not penetrated the mind of the public until my father, Aldo Leopold, wrote his famous book, A Sand County Almanac. And he talked about ecosystems, a word that in those days practically had never been heard. I believe that the future of our communities depends on maintaining a strong, sustainable bond with the land. The Forest Service, as a leader in natural resource conservation, is part of this process. But the best situation is when people are empowered to make these connections themselves. Communication, information sharing, and transportation allows the formation of new types of communities. What I think is where they're digging is right in here, where they all died. The sides are so muddy that they just slip in there and drowned, and they die. On the plains of Nebraska's Panhandle, we find an unusual type of community. It's a community not of place, but of interest. Here, at the Hudson Main Archaeological Site, people from all over the world are gathered to reveal a mystery of the prehistoric prairie. One of the things that I think makes uh, um, the setting that the Forest Service has created at the Hudson Mang site so uh, unique and different from most other archaeological sites is that it, it fulfills and provides uh, a wider range of benefits than what most other archaeological sites do. Otherwise, it's just otherwise it's just a site, you know, another another you know roadside attraction, if you will, you know, to to, to visit. But with uh, with the researchers here, with the students here, there's uh, a lot more opportunity for, to fulfill a wider range of benefits for for uh, a larger a larger community, local community, um, international community. Scientists, teachers, students, visitors, and volunteers are all an important part of the project. It seems to me that there's great potential for uh, public involvement in this kind of archaeology. I mean, it's here, it's available, and uh, it's very intriguing. We don't know the answers, and that's one of the things we're trying to communicate to people, that a lot of times we don't know the answers, but we're trying to even develop good questions, and we've got some great questions when we look at these particular features. We have research questions that we're trying to answer with the excavations. We're not here collecting artifacts to put in museum display cases. So it kind of gives us an opportunity to tell people what archaeology is really all about. Uh, they think archaeology is grabbing the gold idol and running from the infuriated natives. And so one of the things we can do here is show them what we're doing and what we hope to learn from it and the type of information we're, we're searching for. Just how did these bison actually die? What was the climate of the prehistoric environment? How did people use this area over the past 10,000 years? These are just a few of the questions people have been asking since the site was discovered in the 1950s about any kind of research discipline that you can think of that's interested in biology or ecology or um, the interactions of, of living systems in the past has a, a place here in the research in Hudson Bay. Got it. The collaborative process among visitors, volunteers, scientists, and land managers has made the Hudson Main project much more than merely an archaeological dig. That's been the intent here all along to uh, 
um, give back as much, you know, give back to the public as, as much as we, as we, you know, um, as, as we gain in terms of the scientific uh, information. Indian people have a lot to teach us about the importance of maintaining a bond with the land. There's our community steeped in long tradition. For thousands of years, we California Indians have been the weavers of baskets. Yeah, that's good. Baskets have always been and always will be a fundamental part of our lives. And this is a basic. And this, is, this a, is a tradition a that has come down through the generations. My grandmother yeah, taught me to weave just as she was taught by her grandmother. I hope to teach my daughters the art. It's easy for me to gather now because I'm a little bit older. A lot of any people don't, don't know how to make baskets. Other people don't have anybody to teach them. They have to go look for somebody to teach them. I think I'm lucky, real lucky, to have my grandma to teach me. We could split it, start a big cooking basket. With this, it's really strong. Our baskets tie us not only to our traditional culture, they also bond us to the earth. We travel all over the mountains and here and there and gather the materials. And uh, to me, it's still precious, I would say. Indian people actively manage their lands for thousands of years, tending the young plants through pruning and burning. The Forest Service is now learning Indian methods of land management. A lot of the different materials, like soap root, it's being destroyed, so my grandma and Forest Service are replanting. We've been uh, transplanting so that uh, when she gets old enough to make baskets on time, then. You know, the little ones will have a place to go to pick sedge and uh, redbud and get our materials so they can continue making baskets. The baskets just aren't to be sold and look at and like look at for how they're pretty, that it means something to us and that it means a lot to me and it's my culture. I think the, the community is beginning to realize that bringing back our own culture is important. And, and when she gets to be a, a lady, then she could teach her, her, her kids and her grandkids and uh, keep our culture going and make, it, make our culture strong so that our people will come back and, uh, and be strong again like our ancestors. From the big cities of the east and west coasts to the small towns in between, communities are a reflection of their landscape. People in the town of Ranchester, Wyoming, have inherited a way of life that is forever tied to their surroundings. This is the town of Ranchester, Wyoming. It's kind of small. And you can just, when you see people passing on the street, you can just say hi. and you know that they'll say hi back because you know them. And I can't say that I've lived in a big city or anything, but I just like it. The aesthetics of this area, the, the mountains, the people, the clean air, the low impact, I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. All across this country are small towns where the word community has a special meaning. The United States Forest Service has a long tradition of working with rural communities. No longer relying on logging revenues, many of these small towns are finding new ways to boost their own economies. Well, this project came about basically through 
my outlook on the children in this community. We had this pond sitting here that was a gravel pit, basically grown up in weeds and just a just an eyesore. And I said, let's develop this into a fishery for the kids. With startup money provided in part by the Forest Service, the community began a rural revitalization program. And we started out with a very with what we call seed money. And all of a sudden I see changes out there and, I, what, I, and what I would judge are changes for the better. The redevelopment plans include wildlife and historic trails, a children's playground facility, and an RV campground. This project's brought the community together in a lot of ways. Now there's houses developed around this pond and it's uh, economically benefiting the town. We've got people out there building homes that were, where they were, they were having trouble selling homes three years ago. Ranchester, Wyoming, is a gateway to the Big Horn National Forest. And through the small town flow tourists who leave dollars in their wake. We have over 25,000 people annually uh, using this park from basically from May 1st to October 1st. And they do business with our our restaurants and, and our small shops. They come over and fish the pond, they fish the river, they watch the birds and the wildlife, and we say our goodbyes and they go down the road, and, and it's a really nice situation. It's really worked out really well for us. Healthy communities are linked to healthy forests so that in perpetuity, people will be able to use them like you and I see them today. We need to manage our forests and our communities so that happens over time because you looked at those five kids today and it gives them a chance. They need to have that chance uh, because we're the ones that define their living environment. And, and we have to take an active, progressive role in doing that for them because they don't have the vote. They can't make things happen. We can, and we're doing it. The next generation for our children and our grandchildren. Once was a beautiful forest located high in the mountains of California, and one day it caught on fire. After the fire went out, it was decided a new forest would be created, one designed, planted, and managed by children. It was called the Children's Forest. The Children's Forest started about 20 years ago after a big fire and about two years ago 40 kids from around the United States came and designed the trail to create the Children's Forest. I expected it to be just going out and people telling us what to do and how to do it but we got to do almost all of it and we didn't get much help from adults at all. Adults always underestimate the power of kids. You know, we may be kids, but we're not helpless. And we like a little bit of power here. We like to be able to say, this is our forest. Kids get to run things and teach people about things, and that's really neat. Through Children's Forest, I've, I have learned a lot from kids. I've really uh, pr developed a lot of appreciation for what kids can do. I'm developing a lot of respect for them. Kids are oftentimes the part of our society left out and aren't listened to. And at Children's Forest, kids do have a voice. The trail was designed by us, by um, kids. Our information center, that was designed by kids. The, the displays were designed by kids, and now it's, it's going to be managed by kids. Once the forest was designed and built, Kids took over the responsibility of running the forest, including manning the forest lookout and leading guided tours. Children's Forest is important um, because there's a place for youth to, to learn and, and develop the habit of giving service to their community, to, to making the world a better place. In urban areas, from New York to Los Angeles, people are forming partnerships 
in order to regain or strengthen their connections to the land. In communities all across this country, people have come together to plant trees, restore creeks, build parks, and make community gardens. Natural resource agencies like the Forest Service are working in partnership with these communities to help them realize their own goals. Back in 1979, you call a community meeting, you might get three people. Today, you call a community meeting, we'll get 200 to 300 people out. And that's because of the environment has changed and with the, that sense of hopelessness has gone and been replaced by hopes. We always like to say from ghetto to gardens. This is a bug that eats a lot of the other insects. This is a real good thing to see here in, in the park. These are communities that uh, don't have a national park or a national forest in them. The people who live here uh, may never get to go to a national park or a national forest. Uh, and so to some of them, many of them, we are their only uh, contact with, uh, uh, with the federal government, uh, at least the, the natural resource agencies, like, like parks and forests. These changes are happening because they are projects which originate from the community itself. The community has had an outstanding response to this. Uh, they finally, I believe, feel that the government is actually working for them. And it's not a top-down approach. We've been taking it from the community level. We've been able to find out what the needs of the community is and then work from there, rather than saying, well, this is what we're going to do for you. It's more like, this is what we're going to do with you. We're out with citizens meeting their needs and helping them do what they want to do in their neighborhoods. It's a partnership that works. We are partners in this because we sat down at a round table with um, government agencies. They came into our neighborhood and asked us, what do you want? I think this is a completely new way for federal government to do business because we have to actually listen to people and respond to them. And it's not enough anymore to go in and do what we think is best. This hasn't been a situation where the government has come in and said, we want you guys to rehab this park. We want you guys to teach these kids this stuff. This has been where we decided that there was a need to do this been able to accomplish in a few months what would have taken years at any other time. I see community members who are now interested in the work that we're doing, coming out and volunteering here. I do see a difference. This is where the government has turned back over things to the community and have empowered us to be able to uh, make some changes, real changes. And we're the voice and they need to hear from us and we're able to tell them, you know, what kind of changes are need to happen in the community and what needs to be done. So we are the government, yes. An ecosystem is a community. A community consisting of plants and animals and lower organisms all working together, partly in cooperation, partly in competition. And the thing that holds them together is the idea that they all work together, good, bad, or indifferent, in different ways. But the community is what they are. Government agencies are also part of a community. And the Forest Service is one of them. I am one of the really harsh critics of the Forest Service, but I'm also one of its best supporters. And when I see the Forest Service doing something right, I want to support it. They're starting out on a series of projects which try to bring communities into relationship with their land and their resources. That's the kind of thing the Forest Service ought to be doing. <laughs>